Welcome to the 2021 Presidential Inauguration, Lessons of the Past, Informing Our Future, presented by Purdue University. I am David Rheingold, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and moderator for this session. Thank you for joining us. A reminder that all of today's sessions are live and will be posted here for later viewing. Now it's time for a look inside the White House, Election Day through the inauguration with Bush 41, America's last one-term president. Joining me is Andy Maynor, a 1991 political science and communications alumnus from Purdue University. In his early, 19, uh, in his early 20s, he served in the administration of President George H.W. Bush and later accompanied President Bush into private life in Houston after the 1992 election. And we're delighted that he is here to uh, share some of his experiences. Uh, Andy, it's great to see you. And um, I know we have a lot of students listening today. So maybe we could start off by uh, talk a little bit about how you ended up working in the White House uh, for your first job after graduating from Purdue. Well, thanks, David. And thanks to Purdue for putting this together. It seems like only Purdue and Mitch can do things like this it's so well and so classy. Uh, what, a, what an opportunity to talk. Uh, you know, Indiana's always played a central role in politics. You think back to some of your speakers, Lee Hamilton and the Quails, of course, current vice president, uh, Evan Bayh, Luger, what, what, what giants have come from Indiana. So it's, a, it's appropriate that we talk about these things uh, on this day. Um, so thank you for putting it together. Um, I have to admit, if there are some students on the line, I did want to wear my Purdue sport coat today after a great win over the Buckeyes last night. But alas, we're talking about the inauguration today. So um, as a student at Purdue, I, 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 I worked, I kind of followed some simple rules. I tried to show up on time generally uh, and do my best. And I tried to add experiences to my uh, resume uh, each year I was at Purdue uh, and gain incremental experience. And I had to act like an adult and be on time and 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 show up and and then probably the part that I was burdened with being kind of a naive young Midwesterner is I I aimed really naively high uh, and I just started writing letters uh, to the president's press secretary right as I left Purdue uh, you see the picture there I was hired I had different hair back then uh, but I had the same demeanor I tried to work hard I tried to uh, be reliable and I moved up very very quickly in the administration and uh, at being very young all of a sudden you're part of a campaign uh, and then all of a sudden you're part of a losing campaign uh, so I learned a lot of lessons very early uh, but I really I really did kind of try and maximize my time at Purdue and it, it served me very well so uh, Andy if you I don't know, talk a little bit about election night uh, 1992 I know that seems like uh, forever ago, uh, but for a lot of our, our and a lot of our students might not uh, be all that familiar with it. Yeah, uh, 92 was a uh, was an interesting campaign. It was very, very hard fought and it really pitted uh, generations against one another. President Bush had been uh, his vice president for eight years. He was a bit older uh, and uh, Governor Clinton sprang onto the scene with a lot of energy, uh, a lot of vigor. He ran a really, really tremendous campaign. Um, and it really pitted uh, dire the direction of the country at kind of a key moment, uh, right post Cold War, post Gulf War, uh, and it was really a, 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 a really emerging of a, a pretty uh, key time in our nation's history. It's almost tough to go back uh, to that time. Uh, the election, we were on the road basically every day uh, for a year. Uh, got to see uh, the United States every virtually every state. Um, and just to kind of remind people of elections, uh, uh, in a popular vote, uh, President Clinton uh, achieved 43% of the popular vote, President Bush nearly 38%, uh, but a third candidate, an independent candidate, uh, Ross Perot, people know, uh, achieved 19% of the popular vote, yet none of the electoral votes. So the electoral votes finished 370 for Clinton, uh, to 168 for President Bush, which by any standard would be uh, quite a dramatic uh, election victory for President Clinton. So uh, as a person, uh, I was only 22 years old. Uh, that was hard to take. Uh, the highs of the campaign uh, were, were fresh. 
Uh, we thought we had a good message. We thought we had a good record of, 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 of both domestic and foreign policy accomplishments, but the mood of the country was in a different place. And uh, I remember the moment uh, when we had to get the press back together for President Bush to concede. Uh, we also took private photos of the president's concession call to President Clinton uh, in the suite at the Houstonian. Uh, and it was just, as a young person, it was a dramatic moment uh, when all of a sudden you woke up the next day and realized it was over. And I, and and I think, David, I, why I like the, I meant, I meant to say in the beginning, what I love about this panel is I would encourage everyone to realize we, uh, the, the differences between a two-term president leaving office and a one-term president leaving office. Very stark differences in emotion. Uh, emotions are much higher. So before today, the last one-term president was President Bush, my boss, and before that was Jimmy Carter in 1980. So it doesn't happen all the time. And I, I'm glad you focused on it because it is very different for sure. And what was the post-election agenda like uh, it, during that time? Yeah, it's important to talk about that uh, that piece of it because uh, what happened in in the uh, in the in the what we will call that time between November third and the eighteenth um, is would be that uh, first of all, President Clinton visited the White House uh, on November eighteenth. So between November third and November eighteenth, we had two weeks where President Bush laid out what the next three weeks were like. We had a lot of foreign policy challenges in the world, which I'll talk about in a second. But more importantly, he gathered the West Wing staff together and told us his expectations for us in a transition. Uh, he was very clear uh, that losing stinks, uh, but uh, he was very clear that uh, that is what the, the people spoke. And he really taught us that if we loved our country and the actual grandness of our country is the peaceful transition. And he, he often said that the peaceful transition, while it's hard, is actually the, one of the great parts of our democracy. So he told us of what behavior he expected from us when working with the uh, other side, uh, the incoming president, and we were very clear on it. Uh, so when President Clinton came to the White House on November 18th, uh, we we had a, an agenda of how we were going to get our counterparts, uh, teach them about how we do things. Uh, there's always moments. Uh, I remember when they arrived at the White House, uh, the Clinton press corps kind of tromped in through the Rose Garden, and we reminded them that in the Rose Garden, we don't walk through the roses. So little things uh, for a 22-year-old were, were interesting and funny, but you know that's just how the transition was uh, for us. Uh, I mentioned uh, a foreign policy and domestic agenda. There were some pretty major things happening in the world at that moment. Uh, President Bush uh, authorized troops into Somalia on December 4th, so less than a month after the election. Uh, he did uh, converse with President Clinton uh, about that as it was happening. Uh, we also uh, later, uh, President traveled to Somalia uh, for New Year's Eve. Uh, then we went on to Russia, where he signed the START II Treaty, and then he ended in Paris on January 3rd, where he met with French President Mitterrand about the Bosnian crisis. So it's just a framing for people who study history, foreign policy, and whatnot, that the transition didn't allow much for a, a break on some of these very important initiatives. So again, the tone and, the tone and tenor were set uh, by President Bush and Mrs. Bush, and we, we as their staff, kind of fell into fell into line there. And I, so, I, what I, was? I, oh, go on. I was gonna, I was gonna uh, actually, in the spirit of making sure people who are younger who didn't know what a great man forty one was, uh, passed away obviously two years ago. Uh, but there was a ton of fun to be had too, and he made it joyous and joyful for us around the Christmas. We all got to bring our families, of course, to the Christmas party. Uh, we, uh, he played a little prank on us. If you, if you go onto YouTube and you Google Dana Carvey at the White House, he brought him in close to Christmas uh, as a joke. He's the guy that had impersonated him on Saturday Night Live. They introduced the President of the United States. We were used to 
hearing from our boss. Instead, we heard a, a 20 minute hilarious monologue from Dana Carvey. So we had a lot of fun with it. And uh, that's just the kind of kind of man he was. It's great. Um, and so tell me a little bit about uh, Inauguration Day 1993 and, and then sort of the eventual leaving of Washington. How did how did the leader of the free world transition uh, to, pro to private life? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 if you get to hear some of the other sessions, you'll hear uh, you'll hear some of the stories about how it works on Inauguration Day. It's, it's, it's quite scripted, um, and there's quite a bit of tradition uh, in it. Uh, Inauguration Day uh, was, uh, was, I'm sure, wrought with a lot of motion for President Bush. It certainly was for all of us. Uh, all of a sudden, your badge doesn't work the next day. Uh, but a couple traditions that President Bush uh, uh, imparted and, and worked on was this now, which is a little more uh, known. This is this passing of the letters, uh, the leaving a letter in the resolute desk to your successor, which others had done. Uh, President Bush uh, did one, and uh, I, I guess I won't. I won't. I guess I will read you just a couple words from it. But uh, he wrote, that would be great. "Dear, dear Bill." When I walked into this office just now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know you will feel that too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness some presidents have described. There will be tough times made even more difficult by criticism you might not think is fair. I'm not a very good one to give advice, but just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. I am rooting hard for you. Good luck, George. So that I can't explain more what kind of man he uh, was than, than, than to read that. Uh, so they rode up to the inauguration together. Uh, they took Marine One uh, out of the uh, east side of the Capitol. Uh, he asked the pilots to circle in a well-known story. You might hear from Andy Card at some point about that. Uh, he wanted to see Washington in that way. Uh, he then uh, had friends and family. Uh, and an interesting part, for those of you who follow presidential uh, aircraft, uh, by the time President Bush was on the plane, it was not called Air Force One. There's a picture of his arrival uh, into uh, uh, Ellington Field in Houston, it was called Special Air Mission 2800 because he was no longer president. President Clinton authorized the use of that aircraft uh, for him uh, and his family. And uh, President Bush had a wonderful group of friends, his closest friends, uh, one journalist to chronicle it, uh, and uh, 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 his, one of his favorite uh, musical uh, acts, the Oak Ridge Boys, were on board singing to him. Uh, and friends. So uh, we arrived in uh, Ellington Field in Houston, and uh, he was a private citizen. And he spoke to the press, and then we just headed to his new home, which he had rented a home. Uh, and we really had a transition from his core staff, Andy Card, Marlon Fitzwater, were present, my bosses, and they handed the mantle to me. And President Bush put his arm around me, and we went inside and. Uh, began to uh, plot our our new life. Uh, so it was quite a day. I want to show one additional picture. Uh, we did go to the office uh, where we uh, were setting up an office. Here's a picture of President Bush that I took. Uh, he grabbed the yellow pages, which many people won't remember yellow pages, but that is how you found phone numbers. And he said that he wanted to order Chinese food. Uh, this is a man who was in public service nearly 40, more than 40 years at that moment. He had been head of the CIA, ambassador to China. He had been head of the RNC. He had been a congressman. He had been vice president for eight years, president for four. He had probably not driven or ordered food in four decades. And he grabbed the phone book and he wanted to order Chinese from a specific place in the Oaks in Houston. And why I think this is an important story is because I believe that that, set, that moment set the tone for how he would uh, live and how he would carry out his former presidency. His, 
He believed that he was a very young man still, that he had a lot to uh, do in his life. And he believed that his uh, place in history was not set on that day. And uh, I think how you saw him act over the next three decades showed what kind of person that he was. And he believed very strongly in that. And if, if people are interested, uh, so I think it's public, he, he wrote a letter to his son, George W. in 2000 and, uh, and when he uh, left office and gave him the rules of being an ex-president. And they're wrought with humor, uh, but also uh, some pretty poignant moments, which he calls the five stay rules. Uh, stay out of the way, stay out of Washington, stay out of the news, stay away from the press, stay away from the TV, and enjoy your life and your family. So that day to me really set the tone for, for, for how he would be. It's a great, uh, great, great stories. I'm just curious, what was his favorite um, uh, uh, dish, Chinese uh, food, uh, uh, <laughs> dish of Chinese food? I'm not sure I remember that. He was a pretty adventuresome though. He liked to, he, he, he would do it a fair amount and had some friends that had a restaurant right there in Houston that he always liked to order from. Now, I'm mindful Eddie, that, uh, you know, you were you were, uh, you know, uh, just getting started in your career as you're sort of experiencing all of this. Uh, what were some of the lessons that uh, that that have sort of carried forward for you, um, particularly as you're sort of reflecting on the current uh, sort of transition of power? Yeah. And again, I I'm a great spokesman uh, for for 41. I never try and put myself, I, I also did work for 43 and here in Washington, but I try very hard to only speak about what I'm an expert on. And, and, and one of the things that he taught us, he taught me, and I think a lot of my colleagues is the lessons we learned were, were never lessons about being president. They were always lessons about life. Uh, the three that uh, really stick out to me is that he always taught me uh, to treat people like celebrities and celebrities like people. Everyone's the same. Butler in the White House, Lady Gaga, whoever it is, everyone's the same. He expected that of us and it, he's very comfortable to be around in that way. Uh, he taught uh, me a deep love. Uh, he, he, he taught me a deep love for the nation. Uh, and, and he also taught all of us how difficult it is to govern. Um, uh, lately, or people think that it's just easy, you just jump on one side or you jump on the other. Most of these issues are in the middle. Uh, they require uh, a deaf touch. They are not right and wrong uh, at any given point. Uh, and then he taught me uh, a lot because I had studied political science at Purdue. I'd also gotten to study abroad at Purdue. Part of that experience uh, when I was there in 89, uh, studying abroad, was I got to see the fall in the Berlin Wall up close. I also was in Prague uh, and Hungary for those uh, transitions from communism. And so I studied that pretty closely. And when it, later in life, it dawned on me that uh, he really was so poignant in that moment because he won gracefully. The Cold War, the Soviet Union collapsed, and he was not there standing on the wall gloating. It was always President Bush that said, this is the Germans' moment. This is not our moment. Certainly, the U.S. played an important role in it, but he, uh, he, he, he just believed that that's not your moment. And uh, winning gracefully, and then, of course, uh, winning quietly, I guess, would be the better term, and then losing gracefully. Uh, I know he struggled. Uh, with this post-presidency and losing and how did it happen and it, it many months uh, we didn't have a very big public schedule in Houston uh, but he really has started to get on with it and have just an unbelievable life with with his family uh, I'll also just for students of history here I'll also point out a very unique and special relationship with Bill Clinton that grew over time, and of course, this is the person that defeated him soundly, uh, their relationship, uh, as many know, they became very close. They did a, a lot of philanthropy together, certainly led a lot of fundraising after the tsunami in Southeast Asia and other Hurricane Katrina. Uh, but one of the places that their friendship was fused 
uh, said when I was there, President Bush went to Kuwait uh, to uh, be given a very, very high honor uh, by uh, the Kingdom of Kuwait uh, with regards to liberating them from Saddam Hussein. Uh, and there was an attempt on his life that was uh, thwarted. This was in uh, April uh, 19th, to be exact, of 93, that was thwarted. Uh, a, a pretty intense investigation was launched uh, by U.S. authorities, uh, and that investigation came back uh, quite uh, clear on who the perpetrators of that attempt were. Uh, and President Clinton, at no urging of President Bush, uh, responded uh, very uh, militarily uh, to that action, believed it was an action against our nation to take to try and take the life of a former president. Um, that was not that that was all President Clinton and his administration, and uh, uh, that that culminated in military action two months later in June. Um, so that sort of uh, coming together was where uh, it was born, and it evolved over decades. And uh, President Clinton, that many would know, spoke uh, has spoken about him at his death, uh, et cetera. It's it's quite a unique uh, relationship that that really grew and evolved over time. And uh, it's a great story. I, th I think uh, not many people are, are aware of that uh, attempted assassination and uh, and and its sort of consequences for sort of the relationship forming uh, among among presidents. And um, are, anything else? I'm mindful of time. We've got, uh, I think, about five minutes left here. Um, anything else uh, you want to add about uh, President Bush, uh, 41st president, and, and the concept of the peaceful transition of power um, that uh, that you, you observed? Yeah, I, I, I just, I, uh, I always think these are snapshots in time. The country is very different. It evolves. Uh, I think what doesn't evolve too much are some of the lessons that he um, <laughs> that he uh, put out when he wrote his son about being a former president. Uh, he, he his his love for the country transcended everything. Um, I think it was very hard for him to, uh, and people should appreciate the discipline that his son was president for fully eight years, and the attacks on his son were, were pretty uh, regular and pretty poignant, and I'm sure some. Uh, deserved and some not. He held his tongue because he didn't believe it was his place. As he always used to say, I had my time. I can't sit here and um, say, oh, I should have done that. It, you know, sometimes when I watch a Purdue game, I go, oh, I sh you should have put that guy in or put, when you're there and you're the man in the arena or the woman in the arena, it's your time. And when it's not, it's not. Uh, but I will quote a couple things from his list of things uh, as a former president, you should abide by. He said, on Inauguration Day, fly home on Air Force One one more time, lie in the bed. It's going to feel better than seat 35F. When you get off the plane, don't forget to steal a mint. And when you get off the plane, walk down, wave, and don't think about what you were doing three hours earlier. Don't think about the fact you were just president of the United States. Enjoy it. People are going to say welcome home to you, and just say thank you. It's good to be home. It's a, a terrific, uh, terrific story. So, uh, Andy, I'm mindful that um, you know we're we're sort of entering uh, the sort of time of day when you know things are really getting ramped up in terms of the inauguration, and we want to make sure that we give uh, uh, our viewers and and you a chance to. Uh, partake in, in this historic uh, moment. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, so proud of you and all, and all your accomplishments. You know, um, uh, you know, as the as the uh, first CFO of uh, the Homeland Security Department and sort of playing an instrumental role and in, in helping to stand up that uh, sort of uh, reorganization of the, of the federal government, which I think is probably the largest reorganization of, of the federal government um, in in. Uh, uh, in in the modern time, uh, anyway, you, you've got uh, a wealth of experience, and uh, we couldn't be prouder of, of your accomplishments. And um, you know, we, every once in a while, we, we do get you back here uh, on Purdue uh, uh, West Lafayette campus, and you're always welcome to come back and and continue to share your wisdom and experiences with our students. And um, uh, and and uh, you know, we, we certainly are proud of uh, uh, Matt Painter, uh, who's also a, a, a Purdue uh, basketball coach. Uh, who's a CLA uh, liberal arts alum, 
and uh, we certainly wish him well and we're excited by the uh, win last night. So, um, so with that, I think we will go ahead and, and call this uh, session. And uh, again, want to thank you for uh, be making time for us, uh, uh, sharing your experiences and your observations, which are uh, sort of a, a witness to, to history in terms of the, uh, uh, what it's like to be a, a one-term president. And um, uh, uh, for members of our audience, we want to thank you for joining us. We hope that you'll be able to uh, come and, and be a part of a few other panels that are a part of our, our day-long uh, uh, educational programming related to uh, this uh, the, this uh, uh, inauguration day event. So with that, Andy, uh, it's great to see you and uh, wish you and and your family well during these most difficult times. And um, uh, and we will uh, uh, end this session uh, with a farewell. Have a good day. Thanks, David.